So let's, let's first uh, take a look at just some background issues, and then we can talk about uh, some other things going on in this issue of transgender. So what does it mean, transgender? It's an identity that you have of yourself that doesn't match your biology, doesn't match your genetic makeup. Now, if you take it the next step, so that's somebody that just thinks, I, I feel like I'm a woman in a man's body or vice versa. Well, the next step is, okay, I, I feel that way, I'm going to do something about it. And whether it's drugs or whether it's actual surgery, then the term becomes transsexual because trans means a cross, it's a good prefix. So now you've actually made that, you've taken that bridge, you've gone across to uh, actual uh, changing to try to make that target um, gender yours. And transgender is not the same as being gay. And, and the, every website I went to is really clear to point that out. Transgender is how you feel about yourself. Gay is how you feel about somebody else that you're attracted to sexually. So the transgender people, many of them say, I'm heterosexual. They may not s I see themselves as homosexual. They may say we're bisexual. They may say we're asexual. So I try to put in parentheses, maybe if it makes sense, gays are variants of sexuality, right? That's that sexual attraction that they feel. But transgendered are variants of gender itself, how they think of themselves. Does that make sense as far as the difference between the two? I was uh, pretty fuzzy on that until I started looking into this. And as far as estimates go, remember last time we were talking about homosexuality, maybe something between a percent and a half and three percent of the population. Well, again, it's kind of hard to get estimates on transgender, but the best that they've come up with, I've found on several websites, is something like 700,000 individuals. So if you want to do real quick math, we've got over 300 million people in the United States. It's a tiny, tiny percent, isn't it? If it's one percent, what would that be? Three million. Well, it's much smaller than that. So we're talking, what, a tenth of a percent of the population. And yet, look what's happening to the society and how many changes are coming because of this. And so it's an important issue, even if we don't maybe know people who are transgender, they, we're certainly seeing them on celebrity uh, magazines and things like that. So the numbers are small, but the impact, I think, is uh, turning out to be pretty, pretty big. I went to uh, some sites. I just typed in. You can do the same thing. I, I wanted to get an idea at the beginning. What are the transgendered themselves saying? I know that's not fair to just pick a few quotes and say, I've, uh, now I understand 700,000 people. So I'm not claiming that. But I went, I just typed in quotes from the transgender, and I came across things like this, and I wanted to share them with you. People change lots of other personal things all the time. They dyed their hair, they dyed themselves to near death, they took steroids to build muscles, they changed names and majors and jobs and husbands and wives. Why was gender the one sacred thing we weren't supposed to change? Who made that rule? Of course, we would probably have an answer to that, that question, but so there's a, uh, woman named Ellen. I don't know, I guess because I'm an English teacher, I just, I love the title of that other one, Nina Here Nor There. Okay, a little play on words, but so <laughs> this person says, I was invigorated by the possibility of reinventing my own body. The meaning was mine. Does that sound familiar? It's all me. Uh, I'm not going to worry, well, we'll talk about that later, what these things seem to say, but I mean, can you hear the voice that's coming out, the attitude that's behind these statements? Here are a couple more remarks. The whole point of my gender transition was to free myself up. If something feels good, I'm not going to stop doing it because it doesn't fit someone's else, someone else's notion of what a man is. And then one more, look at the title, Transgender Liberation. Like racism and all forms of prejudice, bigotry against transgender people is a deadly carcinogen. Genuine bonds of solidarity can be forged between people who respect each other's differences and are willing to fight their enemy together. So here we go, this, this uh, idea of fighting. We are the class that does the work of the world and can revolutionize it. We can win true liberation. So I want you to hear some of those voices and, and begin to think, how are they looking at the world? How are they seeing themselves? Uh, you can tell that the physical body doesn't really mean anything to them. It's a big deal to Christianity, isn't it? Jesus came in, the, in a body and he was resurrected in a body. So we put great value on the physical body. We're not otherworldly, or Christians are all about uh, the human body. And, and yet it doesn't, that's not what appeals to them at all. Biology is really irrelevant to the transgender person. 
they're self-alienated, which is really sad. They're not alienated from society. They're, they're alienated from themselves. They look at themselves and they say, this is not me. And so that, that, that's got to be awfully hard to live that way. Look in the mirror every day and, and to not see what you want to see. And that search for freedom. Do you notice how often the idea of freedom came up? I want to dye my hair. That's freedom. Okay. I want to change my sex. That's part of the freedom. We're fighting a battle. Liberation. Freedom, freedom, freedom. America's all about freedom. Sort of. <laughs> that, that ends up with anarchy, doesn't it? If it gets carried maybe a little too far. Well, okay, so that's the voice from the transgendered who are putting on a pretty good face in these quotes that I got. But I've got some plenty of other quotes that are really a sad case. So I, I don't want us to see them as enemies or as freaks or, or strange individuals. A lot of them are crying out because of this way that they're viewing themselves. This is from uh, Reddit. I've been crying all morning. A friend posted a candid picture of me and all I see is the horrible man I can't escape. This is never ever going away even after years of hormones. I want to die. And that's not an exaggeration. We're going to talk about suicide rates in a couple of minutes here. And somebody else said this. I feel absolutely like I'm a woman stuck in a man's body. I've had anxiety since childhood and struggled with depression through my teen years. What if these thoughts of being trans are just me trying to escape from these problems? That's a pretty interesting, realistic statement, isn't it, or question. What if I've got all these other issues and the, the transgender feelings are just part of these other issues and I'm trying to step away from them, but those issues are going to come with them. So we're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes, too, that depression and other uh, mental problems are often part of this whole transgender feeling that people are going through. Whoa, oh my goodness, hang on. <laughs> okay, well, no, <laughs> I may have to go way ahead. Oh no, we're okay. Okay, legal, I don't know what I did. So what are some of the problems? Let's talk about some of the problems with transgenderism. I think number one is the one thing that we can just talk to anybody about. We're not going to use uh, biblical questions or biblical uh, statements or you know Bible verses and all. I'm mean, honest to goodness, just realistically, it doesn't correspond to reality. So I was uh, in in a class the other day, and uh, somebody I was going around in groups, and uh, there were about three kids there, and somebody brought up this transgender issue. Uh, it wasn't part of their assignment. I forgot what it came from because I wasn't having them write about it, but it came up in that little group, and so I said, you know. Some people might think of it as a mental problem and not a physical issue that they need to deal with. And they said, oh, really? They never thought that it might actually be wrong or might be a problem. I said, well, if I tell you that I'm a five-foot Asian woman, what do you think? And they were really stuck on that one. They didn't know what to say because they want to be inclusive. They want to say, well, good for you. I said, am I five foot? And they said, no. I said, am I Asian? No. Am I a woman? No. Well, then that doesn't correspond with reality, but I didn't push it. I just said, you know, some people, so I have to be kind of careful in the classroom, but honest to goodness, I've heard people go around and do this uh, talk. They'll, they'll carry a mic around and go to a college campus where people buy into this stuff and nobody will contradict them. This person will say, so I'm a, a you know, eight foot Amazon or something and people go, uh, okay. I don't know why, but they've gotten away from reality. If I say I'm a six-foot rabbit, if I say I'm not even human, are they willing to accept that? Give me my carrots. I'm, I'm a horse. <laughs> right? what, what happened to reality? People like that a long time ago, we tried to help them. We, we said, you're not connecting with what, what the world really is. And so you need something besides affirmation. Do we get you a big rabbit hutch? I mean, what? where do we... Why are we affirming this sort of thing? It, it doesn't correspond to reality. I thought the whole point was we ought to live in this world. If we don't, we've got some issues to deal with. I read over and over again that the, the, there's no such thing, number two, no such thing as really a sex change. People talk about, oh, she had a sex change, she had a sex change. Doctors are saying, no, what you end up with is a man who's feminized because of hormones and things like that, or a woman who's been masculinized. But you're not getting rid of biology. You can cut whatever you want, you can throw as many hormones at them as you want. You don't end up with the opposite sex. You get somebody who's now more distorted than they were before. 
Paul McHugh, number three up here, is a powerful thing, I think. And by the way, I'll send you all the notes if, in case you don't have to, I see Linda trying to jot some things down. Yeah. Just email me. I'll be glad to send okay. you, not, not my PowerPoints, but I put it into about a three-page uh, write-up, so I'll, I'll send you all of this. But Paul McHugh is the former psychiatrist-in-chief, not exactly a low position at Johns Hopkins. Eric and I were just talking about this uh, before class started. He studied transgender people before it was big news. He's been involved with them for 40 years. And here's what he had to say. Johns Hopkins, not a, not a Christian college or anything. It's a mental disorder that deserves understanding, treatment, and prevention. Not embrace, affirm, let's, let's see if we can help them be more of what they think they are. He says, we, we need to fix this. What's the prevention? Uh, well, we'll get to that. Yeah. Two-thirds of all transgendered, if you remember what we said, that one person uh, uh, was talking about how she said, well, what if my issue of transgenderism is just a part of the baggage of all the mental problems I've been dealing with? Two-thirds of all transgendered have multiple disorders. So, so this doesn't occur by itself. It's often part of a family of issues that they're dealing with. And now, back to Linda. Um, we talked about this last week, how many people in the homosexual uh, lifestyle, if you left them alone, they would change and come back to uh, heterosexual on their own, without any therapy, without any input, without any uh, involvement. The same thing has been found over and over again. A vast majority of them grow out of their feelings if you leave them alone. If you don't affirm, if you don't rush them off to the hospital, if you don't get those uh, drugs started, if you don't get that surgery underway, leave them alone and these things not all, but a vast majority of them, uh, studies are showing that they grow out of these feelings. Number five, this is one that really got me because I like stories. I think everybody likes stories. And so I went to several websites and started uh, kind of picking stories out of these people because the transgendered community, thanks to the mass media, gets pretty good coverage. It's all Caitlyn Jenner and it's all people who've been a success and by golly, I'm happy I had that surgery and I'm moving on, life is good. That's what we hear. And so uh, what was it, Glamour magazine that picked Caitlyn Jenner as uh, person of the year or something like that. And so it's all so positive and so reinforcing because these kinds of stories that I want to read you don't get out in the media very much. So bear with me, I'm just doing six stories, uh, there are plenty more. Here's a, a man in his teens, he said, I transitioned to female beginning in my late teens and changed my name in, the early, in my early 20s over 10 years ago. But it wasn't right for me. I feel only discontent now in the female role. I was told that my transgender feelings were permanent, immutable, physically deep-seated in my brain and could never change. Well, that's what they're hearing, right? And that the only way I'd ever find peace was to become female. The problem is, I don't have those feelings anymore. So the he here has changed. When I began seeing a psychologist a few years ago to help overcome some childhood trauma issues, my depression and anxiety, here we go, the, 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 the other conditions alongside this, began to wane, but so did my transgender feelings. So two years ago, I began contemplating going back to my birth gender, and it feels right to do so. I have no doubts. I want to be male. Remember, this is a, a guy who wanted to be female, but the problem is he's had surgeries, and he's completely obliterated his uh, masculinity. And he says, uh, saddest of all, I can never have children, which I pray God will give me the strength to withstand that sadness. So we're affirming people to go and have something. It's like driving a car off a cliff, and, and now what? Now, the whole life is shattered. The whole life is, is different for this individual. Well, that's one story. Um, how about this one? I came into this world a boy. Starting in early childhood, I frequently cross-dressed as a girl. I thought I was born in the wrong body. A nationally prominent PhD diagnosed me as a transgender with gender dysphoria. That's that word that they'll use, or that phrase, gender dysphoria. In other words, you're not satisfied with the gender you're born with. Eventually, I underwent the full recommended hormone therapy and the gender reassignment surgery and became the female Laura Jensen. I lived and worked successfully as a female transgender in San Francisco for several years until I was diagnosed with my own comorbid disorder. Now, I didn't look that term up, so um, I'm guessing from what it says here, these are other issues that they're dealing with, the person is dealing with, and, and difficult issues, psychological issues. 
With proper diagnosis and treatment with psychotherapy, I found the sanity and healing gender change could not provide. Transgenderism was my outward expression of an undiagnosed comorbid disorder, and gender change surgery was never necessary. I detransitioned and returned to my male gender, like so many others do who regret changing gender. Uh, How old was he when he first discovered that he was different? Um, I don't know. It says, I came in this world of boys. During my early childhood, I cross-dressed. I thought I was born in the wrong body, so it said starting early childhood. Yeah. How about Alan Finch? This is a resident of Australia. At 19, he decided to transition from male to female. In his 20s, had genital surgery, but now he's age 36. So he's had, uh, let's see, he says in his 20s, so something like 10, 15 years, he's now lived as a, a woman. Transsexualism was invented by psychiatrists, he says. You fundamentally can't change sex, which is what we heard before, that you can you can have some appearances, but you're still male uh, with a softer edge to your, your female with a rougher edge. You're still that sex. The surgery doesn't alter you genetically. It's genital mutilation. It's been a terrible misadventure. I've never been a woman, just Alan. So he's looking back on it again. He's got this terrible regret. You never hear these in the, in the mass media, do you? You never hear, well, Bruce Jenner has done all right, but there are these other stories. Instead, it's glowing. It's so positive. And so... If that's okay, I'm going to read you a couple more. For some of you who are, uh, have a few more years on you, I don't know if you remember this, but this name popped out of me, Renee Richards. She yes, was a tennis. Tennis. I watched her play in Oakland. She was fabulous. She's a great tennis player. Uh, but she decided to become a he. And, uh, or was it the other way around? Did she transition to become the female? She became, yeah, to become a female. I think that was it. Sorry. So. Wasn't, didn't he start out in Ramona? Play oh, I don't know. He might have, but he's here from California. Yeah, but yeah. I watched him play in the Bay Area but after he made that transition. It was just weird. Well, and and then it just dropped. I never heard of her again. I, this well, is the it's first just controversial at the time to have a man playing at the strength level and the body type, you know, muscular. Yeah. You know, in women's tournaments, it just yeah. didn't work. But I'm, I'm just saying, we, we never heard the rest of the story, like the old Paul Harvey thing, the rest of the story. So here's the rest of the story. If, if there were, she wrote an article in 1999 for a tennis magazine. If there was a drug that I could have taken that would have reduced the pressure, I would have been better off staying the way I was, a totally intact person. I know down deep I'm a second-class woman. I get a lot of inquiries from would-be transsexuals, but I don't want anyone to hold me out as an example to follow. Today, there are better choices, including medication, for dealing with the compulsion to cross-dress and the depression that comes from gender confusion. As far as being fulfilled as a woman, I'm not as fulfilled as I dreamed of being. I get a lot of letters from people who are considering having this operation, and I discourage them all. Wow. There's the rest of the story, but we don't hear that. It's, it's locked away in some website someplace. It's there, but it's just... We don't hear it in Time Magazine and things like that. Instead, it's the new civil rights issue. How about a man named Mike Pinner? He's an L.A. Times sports writer, so he must have been pretty good. That's a big newspaper. He was a sports writer for 24 years, and then one of his columns, he says, I'm transitioning, I want to be a female. And it, it shocked everybody, because, you know, it tends to be guys reading the sports page and going, what? And so uh, he changed. He, uh, let's see. He lived as a woman named Christine Daniels, and he served as a spokesperson for transgender activism. So he's on the front lines. This is good. This is a positive thing. Rah, rah. We need to go that direction. But then, with no explanation, in 08, 2008, he decided to transition. He readopted the name Mike Pinner and lived again as a man. All the posts and bylines by Christine Daniels were mysteriously scrubbed from the LA Times website. Are you surprised? What? The media isn't reporting something fairly? <sighs> um, he discussed none of it, but according to one report, he was devastated over not being able to save his marriage, and then in November 2009, he killed himself. The funeral for him was private to keep out the media, and the LGBT community, if you don't know those acronyms, uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual, and transgendered, they had their own memorial service for Christine Daniels, not for Mike Penner. So they, they saw it as a tragedy for the woman, but not for what he used to be as a man. Here's the last story. Um, a female to male transgender, her name was Van Nancy Verhelst. She was in Belgium. 
after her surgery, after the surgery, then she looks at herself and she says, I'm a monster. She spoke of her sad childhood, uh, had a terrible uh, situation growing up. She was so distraught that she asked doctors to put her to death under Belgium's lax laws that you can do that. And they said, sure. She's dead. Because in Belgium, which I think is probably around our corner, euthanasia. You want to die? Go ahead. Uh, we, you know, anyway, I, that's just hard to hear that stuff. But I just think that's powerful. Um, I, I don't know, I, I have a hard time thinking that there are people that live like that and, and are held up with such esteem by the media. It just it really bothers me that our society has done that to individuals to say, go ahead, be who you want to be, freedom. It's all about freedom. Really? These people don't sound very free to me. And some of them got the freedom to live that way for a while and then died as a result. Richard? You know, I think you hit across something that maybe, maybe other people can relate to here. When I joined the Navy, uh, I found out that I was a Navy reservist. And the Navy, the USN, not the USN, are a reservist, always look down a reservist. You might be a Marine Reserve or Air Force Reserve or whatever it might be, or National Guard. And the other people look down on you like you're something less than what you should be. Maybe there is something about, well, go ahead and have that sex, sex change, but you'll always be something less than a woman or a man. Maybe they need to understand that in their way. Yeah. Now, in some cases, they would probably say, and you would probably say, well, maybe the pressure from a society that didn't understand drove them to the suicide. Rejection. But, rejection. But uh, I'm going to show you something in a minute that I think kind of shoots that out of the, of the water. Yeah, Chris. I, I may be jumping the gun to maybe get into this, but is there any statistics that you ran across about those tragic stories, suicide, how many of this? Yeah, I've got a statistic as far as suicide goes, because they've actually done a study. They, they interviewed, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second, but they actually took a pretty good cross-section and asked them about suicide. Yeah. yeah I know that um, recently, you know, they used to offer counseling for people who, young people, school-age people, they had offered counseling for them to prepare or to find right. out who they yeah. are kind of thing. Right. And they had banned um, these other uh, Christian mm -hmm. organizations. Like Exodus. From, mm -hmm. Yes. Exodus. Yeah. They, they won't even let them yeah. uh, talk to these, these young people yeah. about it, right? Yeah, they don't want to suggest that, that, that what you're going through may be temporary, which we talked about last week, and now we're finding out the same thing. If you hang in there, if you get some medication, if you get some psychological counseling, you may get through this tunnel, you may get through this dark period. A lot of people do, but they're not told that. You're right, they're being held up as a celebration. Keep going, this is terrific. This is the way you ought to live. But they're not hearing these stories that I just told you. It's a lot like Planned Parenthood, I and mean, you can't, they won't allow you. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, yeah. it's a concerted effort to, to oh, keep definitely. from hearing right. the other side. You know. Yeah, it's very frustrating. Okay, how about findings? Uh, so far we're hearing stories. You say, well, those are anecdotes. And I think if you have enough anecdotes, that builds up a pretty good case. But okay, I understand that. People say, oh, it's just an uh, isolated cherry picking of uh, stories here. What about the... <laughs> okay, I am not doing this. <laughs> okay, I have no idea what that... Maybe I'm not pointing at it. All right, let's see. Okay, here we go. Johns Hopkins University. In the 60s, they used to do the surgery. They, they said, come on in. Remember we talked about that individual who had been the chief of uh, psychiatric care there, been involved for 40 years with transgender people. So they were the first medical center to offer sex reassignment surgery. Yes? You know, um, I, this reminds me, though, that the first that anybody, I think, ever heard of Reassignment of sex was Christine Jorgensen. Remember that? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Denmark in the 1950s. I never saw her name come up, so I don't it know what. Christine right. Jorgensen. Yeah. And I have no idea what happened. I don't to either. Him, her. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know. But that was the 50s, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, so somebody needs to look that up. That would be interesting to see. I don't know what happened there. Well, Johns Hopkins, instead of saying, we're in the leading edge here, this is good news, they've pulled back. They stopped performing this procedure. They did a study in the 1970s, and they found out that these people that had the surgery were not better adjusted. It didn't improve them at all compared to a, a group that, was, that did not go through that surgery. So why in the world would you mutilate people if you weren't getting any better results? It's not because they're Hippocratic Oath. They don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. McHugh, he says at Hopkins we stopped doing sex reassignment surgery since producing a satisfied but still troubled patient seemed an inadequate reason for surgically amputating normal organs. You think? <laughs> yeah, you're done, you've sliced and diced and the person comes out and is, is not uh, any better adjusted psychologically. We're back to those other issues that they were dealing with before, hand in hand, and taking care of one part didn't seem to solve anything else. Here's another finding. The transgendered lobby, if you hear them, you go to their websites, and they, again, it's very positive, and they say, oh, come on, uh, only 5% have actually gone through that next step of having a surgery. Only 5% have any regrets. Well, they did a national survey, 6,500 people. That's a pretty good sized survey. This is, doesn't seem like a fluke to me. They said, have you tried to commit suicide? And the answer was nearly 50%, 41% said, yeah. 41 percent. So if you take the other people who successfully did suicide and add it to that 41 percent, it might be huge. Yeah, it might be, might be really big. So but you can't, can't ask them anymore. Yeah. But again, it, it may be, well, but our society is so mean, and that's why uh, they've been driven to this. They did this study, though, in Sweden, of all places. Sweden is so liberal when it comes to behaviors and all that. They should be patting the transgender and all these different people on the head. There shouldn't be that kind of uh, rigid anti-homosexual uh, feeling like the United States. So they did a study. They followed over 300 people who had that surgery done from 73 to 2003, so it's a long period of time. The overall rate of death was higher than expected. Suicide was the leading cause of death in Sweden. Those who had the sex change surgery were 20 times more likely to commit suicide than the non-transgender population. And, here we go again, they went for more psychiatric problems than just the transgender feelings that they had. So this is a study from a country that uh, is very different as far as its sexual outlook than we are. It seems to me, remember when we were talking about homosexuals, uh, people say, oh, you Christians are such homophobes. And the response might be, if you think about doing this, is to say, I'm not afraid of them, I'm afraid for them. In other words, we care about them, we don't want to see them go through this. We can do the same kind of thing. If somebody is celebrating, oh, what a wonderful thing, we can say, well, we all want to help people. Nobody's here to hurt people. The question is, what really helps them? And we've seen doing these surgeries and encouraging this stuff doesn't seem to help people. We want to focus, as Christians, on love. We're not to think of them as freaks and ridicule or anything like that. We want to treat them with love, and to treat people with love is you want the best for them. And so I think that's always a good response. Another response, uh, which I think is powerful for a lot of people, it's called uh, analogies, trying to make a comparison between two different things, and, and people go, oh, okay, I get it. So there's something called, uh, I found this on a website, I don't know, this is called Body Integrity Identity Disorder. <laughs> what, a, what a mouthful, huh? It's people that have, let's say their leg, and they, they go to the doctor and they say, I just, it, it bothers me, I'm just revolted by my leg. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with the leg. Or an arm, it'll be some you know, major body part, they'll say, I, I, I'm just, I'm almost sick about it that I have this piece of me that just, I don't like, it's awful. And the only thing that provides them relief at all is if they get that part amputated. So then the question is, doctors don't seem to be rushing to do this. They're backing off on that. Well, it's wrong, isn't it, to amputate healthy limbs? So I put then, dot, dot, dot. Can you see the connection with, with the surgery that we're, we've been talking about here? You're taking a healthy part of the human body, a healthy part, and you're getting rid of it. Because somebody has a disconnect between here and the body part, whatever it is. We don't tell them, yeah, go in and get your toes cut off if they're bothering you. You say, no, let, let's take care of this and then you'll be okay with your toes. Why would you have you limp for the rest of your life? 
So does the body need adjusting? Or is it the mind? It's the mind, isn't it? I thought number two, I've, I heard this analogy from several websites, I thought this is really powerful. So you're a doctor, and in comes a patient who's uh, 90 pounds, just uh, skin and bones, and says, as you begin to deal with this person, you find out that they're uh, anorexic, just big time bad image of themselves. Every time they look in the mirror, all they see is fat, and they're uh, on this crash diet or no diet, no food at all. So do you say to that person, okay, so you write down all the information as a doctor, so you're anorexic, yes. Well, you know what you need then? Liposuction. That's crazy. That'd be cra you'd, you'd lose your medical license, wouldn't you, if you're the doctor? If you found out somebody had gone in with 90 pounds on them and you were sucking out even more, there's a lawsuit for real that's going to happen. And yet, the analogy, compare that with, oh, well, let's take care of the sex organs here. you got the problem. But it's a, it's a miscommunication between what they think of reality and what the reality is. So we don't offer liposuction. I don't know what a good comeback to that would be. I think you just toss that one out there. Do you offer liposuction to an anorexic? What other things can we do? Well, how about this? They asked a transgender person one time, what kind of support would you like from the church? Here's the answer, one answer, someone to cry with me rather than just denounce me. I always think, years ago I read a book by Phil Yancey. I always recommend Phil Lan Yancey. I love that guy to death. He's got a book called Disappointment with God and um, something about grace. What's it called? Grace, something about why is grace so amazing or, ah, I forgot it. How, how amazing is... <laughs> the Jesus I Never Knew. Yeah, The Jesus I Never Knew. Great book. His books have been out so long now, you can find them used all over the place. Phil Yancey, Y-A-N-C-E-Y, Phil What's Yancey. So What's so great about... Uh, wait, uh... <laughs> no. Darren's working What's on it. Yeah. <laughs> What's so amazing about grace? That's is that right. it? What's so amazing about grace? You've, if you haven't read Phil Yancey, you've got to read him. Anyway, in one of his books, he said he was talking to somebody... Um, who wasn't a Christian, they were just meeting like as uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or something, and he was there. And so after the meeting or something, somebody just shared some really awful things that had been going on in her life. And so Yancey walked up to her and said, have you ever thought about going to church and having people there help you? And said so she just kind of recoiled. She said, why would I go there? And he said it just really made him sick to his stomach to think that somehow the image of the church is a place to condemn, the image of a church is a place to point fingers, the image of the church is to ridicule, the image of the church is to hate. That's not true, but there must be something going on out there that a lot of people have bought into that, that we're haters, that, that we separate, you know, that you got your problems, I got my act together, you're the one that needs help. So, somebody to cry with them. Remember how Job starts off the book of Job? He's got all these things taken out of his life. He's just sitting there in an ash heap, scraping sores off himself, and his friends come. Later on, they do stupid stuff. They give him ideas of why he's in trouble. But what do they do at first? They come and they just sit with him for, is it like a week or something? It's a long period of time, not just for 20 minutes. All they do is just sit and share the misery. And I thought, boy, that's a really good indication. They should just kept their mouths shut. It's the minute they open their mouths that all the trouble happens. <laughs> But what a great thing. They just came and put their arms around Job and just said, we are so sorry, and just sat in the dirt with him. And uh, so I think that's a good comment. Just somebody to, to cry with them. Steve. Yeah, I heard Sean McDowell talk on this issue, and he was contacted. He's out with his kids riding the bike. He was contacted about coming on CNN to talk on transgender issues. And he said, well, I can't. I can't come to L.A. and be on the program. And they said, well, then we'll consider you for the call-in that will start at 6 o'clock. And so he gets home, and he gets a phone call from CNN, and they said, well, what's your view on transgender issues? And so Sean starts telling them how, you know, we as Christians want to love the, the transgender person and this sort of thing. And the guy on the other end says, well, we can't use you because you're, you're too compassionate. Uh, so, sorry. And they, they hung up on it. That's what's controlling the view that people have of yeah. the church is when someone who has compassion can't make it, yeah. can't make the cut. So what do you get? You get that church in Kansas, what's West it called? Borough Westboro Baptist. Yeah. And they show up and about fags this and God hates that. And 
they get plenty of media coverage because that's their picture of Christianity, unfortunately. And that's what's leading people to think about the church. That yeah. They with. That's all they know yeah. about the church. Yeah. That. Yeah. I thought this was a terrific response. This was an article, and I'll give you the uh, link to it in just a second. It was from Christianity Today about transgender um, issues. And so it's a long chunk here, but it's like from three different places. But I thought it was so good. The Christian community is a witness to the message of redemption. That's our message, isn't it? Remember the one last week about Paul's rattling off all the issues that the people in his church that used to be this, you used to be that, and the point was you used to be. You've been redeemed, you've been changed. We are witnesses to redemption through Jesus' presence in our lives. Redemption is not found by measuring how well a person's gender identity aligns with their biological sex, but by drawing them to the person and work of Jesus Christ and to the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us into his image. We're not going to be able to do it. That's not our job. Society's not going to be able to do it. Jesus will. And that's the message of the church. Redemption. You were these things. You can be these other things. Uh, I think I mentioned the other week something that really uh, got to me. It was really powerful here at Emmanuel Faith. They had these cardboard signs that people carried. I used to. And they flip them around how Jesus changed their life. Man, it just sent goosebumps up and down my spine because I said, Wow, that's powerful. Things that were just awful in their lives. And Jesus Christ turned them around. Not a program, uh, not a book, but uh, the living Jesus. The church is called to rise above these, those culture wars and present a witness to redemption. That's our call. It's awfully tempting, and I know I'm a, a prime uh, <laughs> example of that. It's, it's easy to get involved, to, to settle things politically and to get involved in the culture war and make it us against them and you know if we just elect this person if we just shut this person up and we're supposed to get beyond that and present a witness to redemption the author said i hope to approach the transgender not as a project but as a person seeking real and sustained relationship which is characterized by empathy as well as encouragement to walk faithfully with christ isn't that good yeah. uh, seeking real and sustained relationship you can get that in a church you can get that contact with each other. We're all sinners. We've all struggled. And the relationship with Jesus. So you got a, a double way of uh, relationships. So there are some of the resources. That article, I just uh, it's, it's a good article. You might enjoy it from Christianity Today. It's, you can go online. It's June 8, 2015. But again, I'll send you all these notes if you don't want to copy that down. It's just called Understanding the Transgender Phenomenon. And I will send you the notes if you care about it. But FRC is Family Research Council, of course, focus on the family. Uh, Coco always has stuff, so his str.org. And then Hank Hanegraaff's uh, Christian Research Institute is equip.org. All these things have really good articles uh, on that issue, on the issue of transgender.